My Way or the Highway does not apply to the reforming of the authorization and restriction process. Several scenarios have been drafted and the actual implementation is under construction. In the cartoon all directions end at Sunset Boulevard. But is this also the aim? It's one of the topics I discussed with Dunja Jermac of CEVIC and Otto Liener of the European Commission DG Growth, who due to circumstances is in Brussels. Welcome everyone. Uh, before we look in the actual reform scenarios, let's look in the rearview mirror uh, and please sketch the current situation and why, from your angles, a reform of these processes is needed. Yeah, well, I think we are very proud of having the best uh, chemicals legislation in the world. So I think that is certainly something that we take as, um, as our benefit, but uh, we think we're not good enough. Uh, we think that uh, some of the processes in REACH take too much time. Uh, we think that uh, certain chemicals areas are insufficiently uh, regulated. In particular, I'm thinking about endocrine disruptors and persistent substances on which we have regulatory needs, which with the current tools we can't really uh, fulfill. And then I think we also need to think about how to better integrate uh, uh, societal needs, societal preferences in the criteria uh, with which we actually judge uh, the need for continued use of hazardous substances. Okay, thank you. Dunja? Yes, we also agree with that. We, we support the chemical strategy for sustainability and we are also very proud of having a comprehensive uh, and complex chemical legislation, uh, the most comprehensive one. Uh, but what, what we do believe is as well that we do can make certain improvements in the system and we are ready to work on those uh, improvements and we are ready to find solutions. And particularly for the reform of authorization and restriction, uh, the authorization part is burdensome for both the industry and the authorities, so there is definitely uh, a drive to streamline uh, the process more and to make it simple. But what is very important is that what we do today um, is really a true reform and improvement and we don't just rename uh, the process and then in 10 or 15 years we find out that we're facing the same uh, problems as today. Um, so it's really about truly improving uh, the process both for the authorities and the industry and to really have a focused and lean regulatory approach to focus on the substances that, that matter the most. It seems there could be a win-win situation here. Um, the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability recognizes the need for a targeted revision of REACH and two measures that are considered are the reforming of both authorization process and the restriction process. What is the aim of these reforms, both from an authority as well as an industry perspective? From an authority perspective, uh, we aim to be uh, more ambitious in, in regulation. One of the key tools is the generic approach to, to risk management. And uh, in that way, we want uh, uh, to have a, a faster substitution of substances which are of high concern to, to our society. We call them most harmful chemicals now. Uh, and uh, in order to get uh, to get there, we also need to think about the processes, which so far have been too slow. Uh, so we need to make them faster. We need to make them maybe a bit less granular than we are having it today. Uh, but uh, in, I think, doing so, uh, we can actually make those procedures um, adequate so that in the future we can deal with more dossiers at the same time. Okay. And I'm glad that Otto is mentioning generic approach to risk management when we're talking about authorization and restriction because it is simply difficult to isolate the different puzzles of the regulator, new regulatory approach, which is the reform, the generic approach to risk management and the essential use. Um, so we are still a bit discussing these things in silos, but what will be very important is to look at all these elements together um, and really see how will they uh, work um, as a holistic approach uh, in the future. Uh, so this is something that we are also calling on um, to look at it together in the impact in the Commission's impact assessment. And what is also one of the important things is to we are talking a lot about the streamlining to making the processes faster, but we should not create policy by derogation. So we should not create all this uh, mechanism and then transfer all the issues to the request for derogation and essential use because the authorities will simply be swamped uh, with, re with these requests and which will not streamline their work, it will not make their life easier. So what we need to really do is to prioritize early in the process to make sure that we focused on uh, 
hazard on, on the risk and also on the, on the use scenarios. And that way we will make sure to have a lean and focused regulatory measure that is as well enforceable. And enforcement is one of the key elements as well of the regulatory approach. Because at the end of the day, you can have the best legislation in the world, but if you cannot implement it, then it just looks good on the paper. Thank you for the view of CEFIC, uh, Dunja. Uh, of course, you contributed also uh, with your views to the recent public consultation. Uh, one of the questions there was whether registrants should provide more information on critical hazardous properties of substances than currently required under REACH. Um, roughly one third said, yes, you need to provide more critical hazard properties of substances, and one third strongly disagreed. Um, so it's like a traffic jam, basically. Um, what are your suggestions to move forward? With these questions and, and with the answers that you see from the public consultation, it's, it's very difficult to read between the lines uh, because sometimes it's also a bit difficult to, to answer to these questions. But from our point of view, and this is also something that we also elaborated in, our, in the public consultation response, is that the data requested and generated should be really of the added value when it comes to uh, the regulatory management. And in that regard, it, there is really an opportunity in this REACH revision to modernize the legislation um, and to follow up on the latest scientific developments, uh, especially in terms of avoiding unnecessary animal testing, because we also see that the society is less and less accepting uh, the animal testing. So there is really a, now an opportunity to have this paradigm shift um, in the way we assess the safety and the hazard of chemicals and to go towards these new approaches and really to build on all this scientific knowledge that we have and to have the NUMS uh, accepted and validated both by the Commission and by ECA and by the authorities as well. Okay, very clear. Uh, another outcome of the consultation showed, again, an almost equal split between strongly agreeing and disagreeing on the question if there's sufficient concern regarding the risk from certain low tonnage substances, the 1 to 10 ton substances. And they like to introduce additional information requirements into REACH, including the requirement, which is now only for 10 tons and above, for a chemical safety assessment with such a divided outcome. Should we perhaps only focus on substances with strong hazard indication for now? That question again ties a bit with the previous question um, on the NAMS and the new approaches. So again, we, are, um, we agree with the approach to uh, generate CSAs, but in a proportionate manner, um, and also to take into account uh, the avoidance of the unnecessary uh, animal testing. Regarding endocrine disruptors, a clear majority seems to be in favor of providing additional information on both hazard and risk. How can this be implemented? On the endocrine disruptors, uh, I think there was, has been years, if not even decades, of, of knowledge that has been built up. Um, and even currently now, from the, the, from the current regulatory framework, it is possible to identify endocrine disruptors, and many of the substances have been identified as such. So what is really important for this uh, new regulatory framework and new requirements is that they are proportionate, they are workable, Again, they take into account avoidance of unnecessary testing and they also consider the tiered approach by OECD. Another key question of the public consultation focused on the registration of certain polymers in the REACH and also providing information and data on their hazards and risks. Almost half the respondents agreed or strongly agreed. So when will this become a requirement and uh, what are the discerning factors? Well, on polymers, there has been much discussion, and also even in this conference, uh, we had uh, several hours of this discussion, and it's such a unique and, and complex uh, chemistry uh, that uh, currently this framework, uh, in terms of the registration, is not fit and appropriate, so we need to adapt that, uh, the, new, that the new registration requirements are fit for purpose for, for polymers. And then on the other hand, if we look at the complexity and the, the significant numbers of polymers that will have to be registered, there will certainly be a need to increase the capacity and expertise um, in ECA and the member states to, to handle this wave of registrations that will come up. Okay, thank you. Uh, from London back to Brussels. Uh, Otto, for the reform of authorization and restriction processes, uh, three scenarios were proposed. Can you sketch them and already indicate which way to go? 
the uh, three options, they are actually fitting into a broader picture. So we are actually talking about four steps of uh, authorization and restriction. The first one starts with the identification and prioritization of substances for either authorization or restriction. Then we have the restriction and authorization itself, that means the ban of the substance. Then we have a part which is uh, related to the processes how to, of how to deal with derogations or authorizations. So so that's about the continued use of a substance despite the ban. And then finally, we are looking at the criteria with which you, you uh, judge the justification of an authorization or of a derogation. Uh, this, the first part is actually common to all of the options. So we are thinking about strengthening the role of the candidate list uh, to make it also a tool, not only a first step for authorization as it is today, but uh, as a prioritization tool for different pieces of legislation, including the occupational safety and health interface. Then when we're looking at the uh, authorization restriction process itself, part of it that is common is the introduction of the generic risk uh, management approach that we want under all of, of the options. But then comes a key question, whether we continue with listing of uh, substances of very high concern on Annex 14, that means uh, to have a generic ban, which then can only be, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, derogated from via authorization or whether we have different options. So uh, under option three, we're actually stopping that process. That means that there wouldn't be any authorization anymore and anything that is currently done under authorization would have to be done by either EU legislation on occupational safety and health or industrial emissions directive or by national legislation as it is already uh, the case also today. And we would then use the resources for other uh, tools. We have put that to the discussion so far. I think the reactions were rather not this option, rather keep uh, uh, authorization despite the problems that we've seen. Uh, people think that there are also benefits in particular. We are uh, uh, working with much more detailed information on uses and exposure than we do under normally under restrictions. So people want to keep that benefit. So that then leads to the choice between the other two options. Um, do we keep the system as it is? And uh, we just make uh, a few adjustments to make it better. Uh, that means that we would continue with uh, authorization for prioritized uh, SVHCs and for restrictions for all the other substances. Or should we go for a merged system, which would bring the two uh, the two approaches together. That means that we would, uh, like in current authorization, uh, we would continue with authority-driven derogations, that means uh, derogative provisions, which are already part of the restriction proposal and which will then also apply in future to SVHCs prioritized under Annex 14. So we could also there give similar uh, derogations driven already by the authorities where we see we don't want to cover this or that uh, uh, area in the scope of uh, this generic ban, which also the authorization requirement is. Then uh, as a second possibility, we want to introduce a new option uh, that is a bit inspired by the ROS directive. That means that we would allow industry to submit a dossier and ask for a derogation, which would then be of general applicability that applies to everybody uh, and no more require a, 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 an applicant by applicant authorization. And that would have the advantage, for example, we had uh, uh, for uh, Chromium 6, we had 117 applications for authorization. And if we can replace that by a handful of derogations, which then apply to everybody, we think we could uh, increase efficiency enormously. We had similar cases for octylphenol ethoxylates, for example, which is a case where uh, I think the main uh, uh, reason why people need the substance is that they need time to get EMA approval. So if we do that in one derogation or in several derogations, I think we could uh, uh, save enormous time and use those resources to do more on other issues. And then finally, we would in a merged system also uh, continue to have the possibility as an option of last resort, uh, the application for authorization. 
So th that's roughly the three options that we are uh, have put to the discussion, whether we go for option one or option two, or eventually option three. In the end, that is still very much uh, uh, under debate. So uh, it's not yet concluded, but I think the puzzle pieces are coming together. And then finally, at the end of the chain, we also have the criteria where we want to implement the essential use criteria, and that is going to be common to all of the three options. Okay, thank you very much. Dunja, what are Cefic's suggestions on improving the effectiveness of the evaluation process? Yeah, we're actually very glad that the, the Commission is proposing certain suggestions on how to improve uh, the evaluation process because there are certainly things that can be improved. Uh, but what is very important as well is, again, to look back um, at the previous experience and the lessons learned and the, really the practical experience uh, especially when it comes to uh, grouping approaches um, and in terms of resolving the discrepancies between how the industry sees grouping and how the authority sees grouping and so we agree really early in the process so it's not later on my grouping versus your grouping so these are just some of the elements that could be looked at in the future now also one of the interesting proposals in the evaluation uh, reform um, is the revocation of registration numbers uh, which is part of the zero tolerance approach uh, to non-compliance, which we very much support. And we do support this particular element as well, as long as there's a clear legal process in place and as long as the companies can also be heard. But however, it's a very good mechanism to uh, make sure that there's a level playing field. So we very much um, are agree agreeing with that. Now, we do see uh, in this particular uh, element uh, an opportunity for the ECA Enforcement Forum to, to have a more prominent role um, and to make sure that whatever the decision comes out of the revocation is actually um, implemented, that there's a joint uh, enforcement activity across the whole EU. Wonderful. Final question in this interview, where a lot of work in progress is expected. What are the expected effects and benefits of extending the generic approach for risk management to additional critical hazard classes? Now, with the generic approach uh, to risk management, uh, what we've seen from the Ricardo uh, economic assessment, which look really into the business impact of the first two actions of the CSS, so the CLP and GRA, uh, with potentially 12,000 substances being impacted. So we see that there is a huge challenge ahead of us in handling the extended uh, generic approach to risk management. So what will be important is to prioritize um, and sequence the action so the, the businesses and the companies can actually find uh, substitutes. Um, and what will be also pivotal in this approach is to first look at the uh, consumer users with a high likelihood of exposure especially to vulnerable groups and to the most uh, severe hazards, and then to take the lessons learned uh, for the others. Currently, this process in, in the current legal text of REACH does not have legal steps. Now, if we, if we see the extension and uh, the magnitude that it might have as well in terms of the new hazard classes that it's covering and the scope, it will certainly have a ripple effect uh, down the supply chain. So not only on the chemical companies, but also all the way downstream. So it will be very important that the new legal text also includes these legal elements and the legal process in place and as well takes into account enforcement and enforceability of such broad restrictions. Now, just to, last thing to mention on the professional use, uh, because that is also one element that is going to be extended in terms of the scope. Uh, we do agree that, of course, for the consumer users, there needs to be a higher ambition of protection. But for the professionals, if you think about the products that they're using, they need to have a high performance, they need to have a certain function. So uh, before putting a market ban, before extending it in GRA, we do believe that we first need to focus on strengthening the OSH legislation and closing legal gaps, particularly for the self-employed. Thank you. Um, Otto, what are your expected effects and benefits of extending the generic approach for risk management to additional critical hazard classes? Well, in the first place, uh, the benefit should come from uh, replacing uh, endocrine disruptors and persistent substances and possibly also the other hazard classes that we are targeting uh, in consumer products. So uh, the benefit is, is certainly better consumer protection and to an extent also a better protection of uh, professional users who are similar to consumers. So I think here clearly uh, we see um, 
a differentiation between different uh, professional uses that uh, I think we need to make uh, uh, in future. And uh, we recognize that this is uh, something that, that certainly will be a major challenge for industry. Uh, we think it's probably not as big uh, uh, a challenge as we have seen in the study commissioned by CEFIC. Uh, we think that in the end, what we have in mind is is more restricted than than what the assumptions were uh, behind those uh, 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 those numbers that we have seen. In particular, we will definitely start with the uh, the more hazardous substances that means with category one substances and not necessarily go into category two substances at least not in the near future uh, then uh, we will certainly differentiate between different professional uses uh, we will differentiate between different articles so also there uh, we will look at uh, articles first which have the highest potential uh, for exposure and uh, with that, uh, uh, we think that we have a program that is ambitious, but that is also feasible. And uh, uh, there, uh, we also want to help industry by uh, uh, give a good planning uh, uh, ahead. So we want to develop work plans that, uh, that give signals uh, to industry that they should start substitutes in time uh, and uh, uh, enable then uh, uh, a smooth process for substitution together with other tools that we are planning also we try to strengthen substitution plans in the context of authorization and restrictions for example so uh, the sign is definitely where uh, a substance is currently used uh, we want to give good planning we want to give support also uh, to uh, to master the transition and uh, last but not least we also also want to reflect that in the transition pathways that we're currently elaborating together with the chemicals industry uh, towards a, a greener and digital but also safer uh, future uh, for for europe Otto and Dunja, thank you very much for joining me on this road trip and clarifying some of the directions and expected road improvements. Soon the authorities will point everyone in the new direction and after that industry can easily navigate again with the revised and updated REIT regulation.